All right. I think we can hop right in and get to the meat of the day. Josh, I'm going to hand it over to you to take it away. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce chef, restaurateur, author, environmental activist, and media personality, Chef Mary Sue Milliken. 2021, Hi. hello. <laughs> 2021 marks 40 years since she opened her first restaurant in Los Angeles. And in today's conversation, we're gonna run the gamut from how she survived the last 15 months to how she's thrived for the last 40 years. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Copel. I'm a Michelin rated restaurateur who spent the last 15 months talking about running restaurants instead of running them. I've done this with a singular goal in mind, to figure out if there's a recipe for guaranteed success in the restaurant industry. I also host Full Comp, a podcast that airs twice weekly, unpacking the tools, tactics, and strategies of industry leaders. It's a selfish endeavor. I have the privilege of talking to the folks I idolize, and I only ask the questions that I wanna ask. But the town hall is your turn. Today, Chef Mary Sue will answer your questions that you've asked, and I encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions throughout our conversation if anything pops up that you want to dig deeper on. We're also leaving time for live Q&A at the end of the town hall. With that being said, welcome, Chef. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so excited always, to chat with you. I always love talking to you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, I got to tell you, in, in our full comp interview, I, I took so much away from it. My wife said it was her favorite episode of the show, and my wife is incredibly picky. Oh, wow. Good. Well, that's that's good. She should be. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Emily, can you go ahead and transfer so that I can share my screen, please? I'm good to go. Thank you, ma'am. So chef, if we're just gonna jump right into this, the first question that came from the audience is, what are some of the silver linings or valuable lessons uh, that have come out of the pandemic for you? Well, um, gosh, there's so many. Um, you know, uh, the, one of the biggest ones was, you know, as a founder and restaurateur for 40 years um, with my partner, Susan Feniger, we've, you know, we've worked really hard to um, not be control freaks. <laughs> and I think the pandemic kind of, um, you know, we're, we're in our 60s and I think it just sort of, we wanted to stay home and be safe. So it allowed us to really let our team step up to the plate and do so much that um, I think we, as, as, for, as for 10 years, we've been trying to do this and to let go and to step back and to, give them more responsibility. And I think we have to some degree, but the pandemic sort of just put a real like, you know, exclamation point on it. We've been leading from home and um, it's been really wonderful. And another thing that's been great for my business is that we've um, learned how to diversify our income streams, which I think has been um, something that the restaurant industry has needed for a very long time. Um, if, if you're beholden to just the whims of the public that are gonna walk in and you don't know if they're gonna order fish or chicken or beef or vegetarian or what, um, then that's a pretty limited uh, kind of income stream. But we've been adding, you know, meal kits and frozen food to go. And we do a lot of meals for the homeless, which is um, interestingly, because we know exactly how many we have to have ready on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and we buy exactly the right amount of food for those meals. It, it, it's um, the, the margins are actually a little bit better there, which is kind of a surprise to me. Well, it, and it's incredible because it, it's the one thing that we lack in this industry, especially when it comes to revenue, is consistency. You can't you can't rely on anything, and so having those other revenue streams does create a, a, a consistency of income to a certain degree. Yeah. Oh, totally. And um, I, I plan to really continue to grow the business in kind of, kind of, you know, out of the box think with out of the box thinking and some new kind of ways to um, connect with our customers besides just in the restaurant eating our food. You, you brought up, you brought up a really big idea that I think most of us struggle with, which is, you know, that, that dichotomy between working on your business versus working in your business. And, and I'm curious to know, 
as you guys were forced to delegate and forced to empower your teams to new degrees? Were, were, were there tools or tricks or, or lessons that, that helped you do it in a way that not only worked for you, but worked for them as well? I think, um, you know, over the la- over all these 40 years, I, I learned each year to be a little bit more um, of a cheerleader and less of a critic and um, find ways to, you know, just accept that, you know, um, there's going to be failures and there's going to be stumbling blocks and there's going to be problems and that in that jumping in and saving my team is probably less effective than letting them live through it and come up with a solution as well for themselves, which is um, really hard to do <laughs> to, oh my God, to, watch, yes. <laughs> to watch something you think you could probably fix. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do think that, you know, it's a balance between jumping in and helping and trying to s- stay back and let, let, them skin their knees and do whatever they have to do to kind of get to the same place. Um, And I think, uh, but the most important thing is, you know, treating everybody with the utmost of respect and being a cheerleader in, in terms of, you know, believing in them and letting them feel that you believe in them so that they can believe in themselves. And, um, you know, it, I think for entrepreneurs and founders of businesses and creative people, it's hard to do that because, you know, you get conditioned to think that you're the reason you're successful is because you worked so hard and because you handled every single order and you touched every sauce and you tasted every single thing in the whole walk-in, but uh, comes to, you know, when you come right down to it, that's not even the truth. I mean, some of the best dishes on our menu were collaborations between, you know, our our team without even, with only a little of our input or maybe none. So um, you just kind of wrapping your head around the fact that um, you can stifle the um, growth and development and creativity of your team if you hover too much and you're that helicopter kind of boss. It's one of the biggest hurdles in the industry. Yeah, it really um, does. It's a it's a block to growth for sure. Well, and and speaking directly to that, I, I'm curious to know how you've worked to inspire confidence and a sense of security in your team during these times, which are so uncertain. Yeah, that's. Um, I think. We've been very lucky. We um, we have a solid team that we've worked together for many, many years. And I mean, I have some people on my team that have been with me 30, 35 years. Um, and then I, I think uh, one of the things that I use that's important, I think, is especially when you're in the middle of a kind of a what feels like a bit of a, um, you know, a tense kind of, like you said, uncertain and kind of disastrous time, a potentially disastrous time. I I always ask people, you know, before we start talking about anything else, I ask how their family is. I ask how they're doing. How was their, you know, commute to work or, you know, what's going on just in your head. I think just making sure that I connect with people on a personal level before I dive into the business is a, a really good tactic. And, um, you know, also I've taken this time to really, um, sit back and reflect and, and do a lot of webinars and a lot of kind of informing myself of things that are going on in, as far as policy goes, or what grants are out there, what, what the PPP and the RRF, how they, how they can affect our business and all the things that I can do from kind of the 30,000 foot view, and then bring that to the team. And I think that gives them that sense of security and confidence that there is, you know, there is sort of uh, a rudder, you know, and we are going forward and we are looking underneath all the rocks in front of us to see if there's something we need to either plan for or take advantage of, or, 
you know, watch out for. And I think um, that helps the team to feel kind of like, like, you know, coming in every day. And, and also I think we're, we're incredibly, um, it's our team first, you know, it's first, the first question is, is it safe to reopen? Is it safe for the team to work that close to the customers? Do we need any kind of other barriers to keep the team safe or, um, you know, we, what else can we do? Can we have people come to the restaurant and test once a week? Would that be helpful? You know, just making sure that they feel that they are a priority um, because, you know, we're all going through this, but, and everybody's a little afraid, frankly, people, oh, yeah. you know, millions of people have died. Millions of people have long COVID and bad um, you know, side effects and result, you know, lingering effects from having, you know, had the disease. So I, I do think that, um, that, you know, your if your team feels really cared for, then they're going to do a much better job of caring for your customers and each other. And I think that's just the, one of the most important things. Well, and I think it really helps with retention, but the next question deals specifically with acquisition. Um, word on the street is we're in the midst of a labor crisis. I would argue I was in a labor crisis in the midst of 2017, 2018. I think it's been a long time coming. Yeah. And I thought it was a really relevant question, especially relative to the operation that you're running. It's how do you attract and retain quality help without incurring sky high labor costs? Well, I think um, you're right. It's, this has been coming for a long time. This is a very difficult industry and it, it is, you know, historically low paying and um, kind of punishing. And there, there has been this sort of feeling of, you know, um, kind of valor if you can, if you can get through the day and, you know, and people would come into work sick and they, you know, because they could show their macho, you know, we could do this in the kitchen or in the front of the house. And we've always been kind of historically staffed at just the minimum levels in, and then that means that you do need somebody to come in, even if they have the sniffles, because you have nobody else to come in and you're gonna, you know, the, the whole operation is gonna suffer. So what the pandemic has really, taught me that I think it's a big, broad question and a big, broad initiative that has to happen. But our industry needs to change. We need to staff up a little bit more and encourage self-care of our employees so that they are not, um, and, and kind of get rid of that sort of whole, you know, macho kitchen confidential kind of attitude about the restaurant business that, you know, we're all tough as nails and um, just going to slog through and work double shifts and do whatever it takes. Um, but then the c consumer is going to have to pay more money for their food or the government is going to have to give more tax breaks to hospitality and, and restaurant industry. I mean, mom and pop restaurants, small business restaurants, which are the bulk of the restaurants in the country are the sort of fabric that knits the whole community together. And I think everybody would agree all co the consumers were, you know, affected deeply by having restaurants be closed and not be able to go to restaurants or to be able to go in, in sort of such a restricted fashion. So I think now is a time that we can actually drive forward some progress in the industry. And um, I've been spending a ton of time on that as well. That's been a big focus for me because I love this industry and the magic of it. And, you know, when, when it's a Friday night and it's service and the bar's full and we're, you know, the dance is happening and everybody and everyone is synchronized in a good way. And the, you know, the kitchen and the front of the house are flowing, interacting. And, you know, there's something so magical about that. Oh, and, yeah. and we need to keep that alive, of course, but we have to also um, find a way to make the industry more equitable, more um, hospitable to staff. You know, prep cooks should not have to work two jobs 16 hours a day in order to be able to pay rent. And, you know, I, and I think the reason it's so hard to find uh, people right now to work 
is because for the first time ever, they had time to, to be with their families and to think about, well, what would happen if I worked in a different job where I could actually earn a, a good living, a living wage and only work eight hours a day? You know, um, so we've, we've lost a lot of people who just have made the decision that it's not worth it. It's too, too hard. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I always flash back to this moment that I've referenced on the show many times uh, where my GM came to me and he was a younger guy, millennial, smart guy, super talented. I was lucky to have him. And he came to me one day and he goes, I want to give you my two weeks notice. And I was like, why? And he goes, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Like I could go do anything and work less and make more money. And my response was, you didn't know that before you took the job, you know, and it's, I, I agree with you that it's the, the only way to lure people back in is to give them something better than, than with their current view of the industry is. And, and I think it's up to me as an owner and operator and you as an owner and operator to determine what that future looks like on an individual basis. And then we attract those people that, that, that have the same values and that are looking for the same things in life. Um, I, I think gone are the days where a perk of the job is having two days off that are back to back. I hope. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, that we've been headed there for a very long time. I think for at least 25 or 30 years, we have not allowed people to work more than five days a week. And we've insisted that they have two days off in a row. But that's, you know, that's sort of the bare minimum of a, sure. of a human job, you know, and, and we were doing that long before our, many of our colleagues. Absolutely. Um, what do you think are the best ways to stand out as a restaurant? If we were to pivot in, into marketing and branding and positioning, um, especially in Los Angeles, right? Because it's a competitive market and a competitive industry. What do you think are the best ways to stand out and how have you managed to stand out? You know, um, it's a great question. And I think for me and Susan, it's been very much just, you know, go by the gut. Um, we didn't, we didn't, you know, scheme about, about how we could stand out or how could we be more, you know, competitive with our competition. We instead kind of followed our real solid passions. And, you know, when we learned how, the oceans were being affected by the overfishing. And, you know, we learned about sustainable seafood. We jumped on that immediately and we made a big deal of it with our staff who were very resistant, but um, who came around pretty quickly. And then we, and this was 25 years ago, but then, you know, the customer too, I think kind of, so then we differentiated ourselves in terms of our sustainable goals. Each year we would add one more um, thing. And some years it was something tiny, like, um, you know, we'd get rid of the use of styrofoam, which we never really used very much of, but maybe had a little, or we'd get low flow toilets or we'd, you know, but other years it would be big. We'd be, you know, yeah. we're going to um, use all uh, organic rice and beans and corn products, you know, like across the board, the entire company. And, and before COVID, we had about 380 uh, employees and, you know, we were doing maybe $20 million a year in sales between all of our locations. So when you make a decision like that across that whole spectrum, it's a lot, it's impactful. So I think customers, um, are attracted to that. It's compelling. Uh, that is a story. I think we also are very, um, uh, we like to have fun. So, so we like to create a festive kind of fun environment for our customers. And which means that we're kind of constantly changing, you know, it's whatever is sort of making me excited this week or next week, you know, that kind of filters into the into the restaurant um, in some way or another. So, um, but I think the passion is what really stands out is if you're following your passion and you're really true to it and you're totally authentic to who you are as a restaurateur, I think the community likes that. I think they can feel it. They, but if you're trying to be something that your competitor is, or you're trying to be something else, you know, 
it, a restaurant is a real expression of of who the owner is. I think absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, and I would argue that that when people go to your restaurant, it's not to support this faceless corporation. It's to support you, and it's to support Susan and the initiatives that you're fighting for and the values that you espouse. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned changing. You know, how have you managed to keep your restaurants relevant? over the course of so many years. It's, Lord knows trends have changed and trendy is good for a, a minute, but how do you create something that evolves but is timeless? Um, well, you just keep evolving it, basically. Like, uh, nothing stays the same, nothing. And I think um, we are very open to change and very, we are very curious people. So we're constantly looking at the next thing. I mean, I remember 1990, four I think <coughs> excuse me and I um the internet was just becoming kind of a thing not that it wasn't there already but like I think we were one of the first restaurants in the country to have a website because I was like this is really cool let's let's build a website you know and um it wasn't a thing it wasn't the thing that <laughs> all the restaurants had you know, um, social media we had to embrace, you know, even though I was slow to the party and I still find it very, um, you know, um, I find it wonderful, but it's taxing. Yeah. It does it take, it does take time and energy and, you know, that having that voice, that public voice that is also now part of my business. I, I have my accounts. Susan has her accounts. Each restaurant has their own account. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great tool, but it's also a lot of work, yeah. but I think embracing every new thing that's coming along. I was just harping at my team. <laughs> well, I try to do it in a cheerleader kind of way, yep. but I, I was just saying, look, I, I want the customer to be able to order from their telephone, a second drink. And I want them to be able to pay from their telephone contactlessly so that, you know, these are things that are coming down the pike. We should embrace them now and do them because, you know, otherwise we'll just be late to the party. I, I so, couldn't agree with you more. And, and, yeah. and it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to change because your neighbors aren't changing. Right. How, how do you deal with that fear when it comes to changing? Because I'm sure you're worried at times, especially with the bigger changes, like changing the style of service, that it, it will be a misstep. Yeah, um, you know, we talk, we have, we have lots and lots of collaborative meetings. I think we listen really carefully to the team that's on the front lines, the, the servers, the bartenders, the AGMs, the GMs, the chefs and sous chefs, you know, they're all involved in this decision making with us so that we, you know, we're throwing out ideas at each other and, and to each other and then collectively collaboratively coming up with what we think is right for each business. And um, I think that's had a, that's been a winning combination. I think we learned a long time ago, we had something called a leadership, what was it called? The leadership circle. So once a week we would have one bus boy, one dishwasher, one server, one line cook, one prep cook, um, you know, and they would get together with the, the, manager and chef to t give ideas about how the restaurant could run better. And I think, um, you know, you, you can't be ever so glib um, to think that you know everything that's the right thing for your business. But if you really listen to those people who are working the front lines and working those positions, then you really, um, and you, if you collaborate, which, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a big time collaborator. I've been partners with Susan 40 years. <laughs> I mean, we, I really love to collaborate. So I would almost call it codependent. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you feel overwhelmed at times? And, and when you do, how do you, how do you manage that as, as a, as a human and as a leader? Oh, all the time. It's a constant thing. I, I, I describe it as my overflowing plate and I kind of, um, you know, I, I take on way more than I can handle. Um, I hate to say no to anything. 
I, I have my hands in, you know, many different uh, things, not only my businesses, but I'm on the um, board of trustees of the James Beard Foundation. I've just founded a new organization called Regarding Her, which supports uh, women uh, food and beverage entrepreneurs in LA County. And we're going to be expanding all over the country in the next six to 12 months. And, um, but when I feel overwhelmed, one thing I kind of remind myself of is that my brain, there's my conscious part of my brain, and then there's the subconscious that um, is working all the time. And I don't know what it's doing, <laughs> but I trust that what, that it is helping me to um, prioritize. You know, I, I write a lot of lists. I do, you know, I love to, I still like to write, take notes in every meeting longhand. Um, it's probably, I never go back and look at them, but it helps me remember things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think prioritizing is important, but I also just trust that the right things are going to bubble up to the top of the plate and they're not going to fall off the edge and they're going to, you know, it, it's, I just trust that I'm going to get the right things done. And I'm, I'm very, um, you know, I was raised in a very German family. So I'm really like, I have boundaries and I have, you know, I have goals. And if I want to have dinner with my family every night, seven nights a week, I'm going to do that. I'm going to stop working and I'm going to sit down with them and I'm going to be present. So I, um, and I think that helps the, with the feeling of being overwhelmed. I think if you, if you're overwhelmed and you think, okay, well, if I just throw more hours of work at this, I'll be able right. to dig my way out. That's not necessarily true. You know, that's the work-life balance is so important in helping you to, you know, some things should fall off the plate. They're, they're kind of like stupid and you didn't really have to spend your time on them probably. Well, and you just seem so happy. You seem so light in an industry that, that I, I mean, there, there is certainly joy in moments, but, you know, we get slapped across the face a lot. We get kicked in the butt a lot on a daily basis. And you always have this, this enthusiasm about you. What fuels that? Oh, I don't know. When I was a little girl, my older sisters called me little Mary Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's part of my DNA. I'm just a glass half full kind of person. And I really, um, it serves me well. It just is, you know, I don't want to go through life really, um, spending a lot of time worrying about things I can't control. I really want to, um, I just want to enjoy life. You know, it's too, we're not here that long and it's, um, you know, but I, I, that's not to say that I don't have really bad days and I don't get really down in the dumps and I don't have, you know, heavy things that weigh on me and I worry about, but I try to just keep that balance. It helps me to exercise a lot. I, I play soccer. I go hiking. I do yoga a couple times a week, three, four times a week. I, um, you know, cycle. I'm a big cyclist. So um, that helps a lot too. I, I, in, incredibly, like I'm not a good meditator. I couldn't really do that. But I think some of those exercises like cycling is meditative. And like mm -hmm. I said, the, the back part or the unconscious part of my brain is sort of um, getting cleaned out and, you know, reorganizing the priority of what really needs to get done that I might have that I think, oh, my gosh, I might have forgotten. But um, I think I just I, it's just and I wasn't like this when I was 20. I was much more serious and much more driven and much more, you know, kind of like, you know, what do you learn? I'm 63 and I feel a lot lighter. <laughs> than I did, you know. It's beautiful to see. Let's <laughs> let's get back to sustainability um, because you're a huge advocate for it. I, you know that, that this is something you and I align very much on, but this question comes up constantly, which is how do you work towards that? How do you achieve it? And it, and it make financial sense for the restaurant at the same time. How have you guys made that work? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of initiatives that I haven't been able to embrace yet because I'm afraid that the financial model is too broken to afford that. So 
<clears throat> but, you know, I, we still try to take on one new thing each year. And that's been going on for 25 years. And like I said, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. Um, you know, everybody in the company knows that it's a priority. So nobody, you know, is not on the same page. I think it also helps with uh, employee retention. I think, you know, employees work for a company, not just for their paycheck, for sure. You know, they also, they wanna feel like they're part of something important. So if they're at a table talking about sustainable seafood and kind of helping somebody ed get educated about what's going on, that's a very um, gratifying thing for a server. And I think, um, you know, the, so it does cost a little bit more, not always, but it does cost more. And there's certain, you know, the, some of the more expensive sustainable products that I, that we don't, we can't afford because we're not a, we're not the French laundry, <laughs> you know, we have real, you know, our average check is $25. We, we want to be a, a accessible to the broadest public we can and still buy products that we're, we're comfortable with. You know, we don't buy organic meats, but we buy meats that are raised with never ever antibiotic use. Or, um, you know, so we're in, you know, dairy products without um, hor growth hormones and, you know, so we, we're, but we're not able to necessarily afford all organic dairy products, mm -hmm. for example. Um, which I would like to do, but, you know, I think, so for those things that I don't feel like we can afford quite yet, I lobby hard with the government. You know, I work on those issues to, because they shouldn't be more expensive, you know, with the, with factory farming, we're paying the price in, you know, public health problems and, you know, preventable diseases that are diet related. And um, we're, we're, the society is paying a huge price, you know, it, like getting our legislators and our lawmakers to see that, you know, that's what I'm hoping, that's what I would, that's what I hope to do with my advocacy work, because, um, you know, I worry about the planet too. I want, I have two kids and I, someday I might have a grandkid or two. And I, <laughs> I think that they should be, um, you know, afforded the same beautiful, bountiful, just, you know, variety of seafood and vegetables and meats and, and food that I have, you know, been so lucky to have had throughout my life. So, you know, um, I think it's, it's just, you know, you do what you can, you do as much as you can, and it has to make financial sense. If, if it doesn't, then, you know, you're going to go out of business and that doesn't really help. <laughs> Anybody. Well, and we, well, and we've also talked about it before, and you've said that to a certain degree, you are able to pass it on to the customers because they're they're aware of your values and, and they understand that they're paying a premium, even at twenty five dollars. They're paying a premium to be part of a movement as opposed to just a meal. Right, and and you have to you have to communicate that you know on your menu, which is it's a also you know it's another layer of work that you're trying to, you know, I mean, restaurateurs have to wear so many different hats. You know, you gotta, if you have a small business, you're, you're the marketer, you're the um, social media person, you're the chef, you're, you know, the GM, you, the, the bathroom scrubber sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's definitely, um, you've got to, you've got to make sure your customers are engaged on that level. And, and getting servers and, and who are your frontline marketing people, getting them to take the time and understand the message is also really cumbersome and time consuming. And, um, you know, it gets, it's all this delicate balance, but when it works, it's just so, so, you know, empowering and exciting and, you know, fun that, and we've found a way to make it really work, which is great. Absolutely. I mean, one good thing too, one good thing too, I would say is you can lean on other people. Like when we have pre-shift meetings, we sometimes have um, Sheila from Monterey Bay Aquarium come and talk to our staff about sustainability. It doesn't have to just be us or the city of Santa Monica uh, sustainability officer could come and talk to our pre-shift about um, 
to go packaging and and everything so that 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 there's a story there that you're helping your staff to understand and to pass on to your customers well and i think that bleeds right into the next question which is how do you ensure world class service in your restaurant and you and i have spent a lot of time talking about you know the, the way we try and take care of our staff um, but you also have the same reverence for your patrons and so how do you make sure they're being taken care of, not just in an elevated way, but also in a consistently elevated way. Yeah, it is so important. I think actually service in your restaurant is more important than the food. I'm, I finally come around to, <laughs> I never thought that was the, I always thought it was the food, but you know, you can have the best food in the world, but if the service isn't there, people don't want to come back. They just don't. So I think, um, you know, like I answered the question about how I keep my team motivated and feeling safe and secure through COVID, I think you got to really, we, I mean, I don't have to do this anymore because I have general managers and assistant managers and all kinds of other people who do a lot of it, but they, you know, they have to connect. You have to, in a human way, connect with your entire team, one-on-one -on -one plus in groups and really listen to them and then um, be clear in what you expect of them. So, you know, we have our um, sequence of service, which is just, a it just hangs on the wall. It's like, this is the first thing that happens to the guests when they walk in the door, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And so people understand, everybody understands from the, you know, runners and bussers and expo and barbacks and, you know, everybody knows what's, what the customer's experience is supposed to be for our restaurant and it changes our new restaurant Sokolo that just opened a couple months before the pandemic um we do counter service during the day and full service at night so and the counter service is the first time I've ever done a restaurant like that it's been a little bit like oh don't I want to give them more service I can't stand for them I, there's a line of three people I'm like oh no it's three mm -hmm. people staying trying to order their food um but you know, we found a way to make that work too, you know, really well, I think. And um, it's a neighborhood restaurant. It's really meant to be a hangout for the whole neighborhood. And we're right across the street from a big hospital and a lot of medical towers. So we have a lot of, you know, we, we want to be part of the community. So um, I think getting your team to really know what's expected of them and then to know that they're valued I mean, people come to work, they want to do a good job. They're not coming to work because they don't, you know, but, it, but it's our job to give them all the tools and the coaching and, you know, make sure they feel valued. What does the other side of that look like when it comes to accountability? Well, um, you have to be, you know, people don't like confrontation. And especially people in hospitality, because For sure. we're all about making everybody feel good all the time. So what do you do when you're faced with the, the difficult uh, task of telling somebody they're not living up to your expectations? You know, um, I always say that the worst thing you can possibly do is to just stay quiet because then it builds up and builds up and builds up. And then it, you're already to the point where you're ready to can someone or fire them because, you know, it, you've had all these infractions, that, but you didn't talk about it. Right. So I think um, every little tiny thing, you have to try to point it out and, you know, talk about it and, um, you know, at, you know, just say, do you understand this is what I need? And um, then, then it doesn't come as that big a surprise when you have to have the really difficult conversation. So for sure, I think, yeah, I think the, and also to, to, to coach in a way that isn't um, demeaning and it isn't, you know, you're not disappointed. You just want to point out that this is what, you know, that table has been sitting there with some dirty dishes for too long and you didn't, you, you prioritized, you know, folding napkins, but I'd rather have you over there clearing the dirty dishes because that's a For higher sure. priority. So just giving people good coaching and constant feedback on how they're doing and also 
very important, which it took me forever to learn was, you know, um, positive reinforcement because I don't, you know, I don't, I see the positive things happening, but what I focus on is the negative because that's Mm -hmm. what needs changing. That's what needs fixed. So it's really easy for me to rattle off all the things that aren't going well, but it's really unnatural for me to say, oh, wow, you know, your (laughs) uniform looks great today or, you know, that, that I have to work at really hard. I have to, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's just not, oh, it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> we, it, it, it and proper, we call it the poop sandwich where you say, hey, you did this great. I really need you to work on this, but I love that you're doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And hopefully that works, you know, it doesn't feel inauthentic because it has right. to feel really, really like you mean it. Absolutely. Um, how, how involved are you in the marketing efforts of the restaurants? And is there a formula you found? Because you are certainly a media darling. Is, is there oh. a formula that you are? And, and is there a formula that, that you, you've you used to get noticed that you've replicated over time? Well, I've, um, I've, we are very, very involved in the marketing efforts of our restaurants. Always have been from day one. Um, you know, when people started having PR companies represent them, I was like, what are you crazy? You don't need to spend five grand a month to have that. That's ridiculous. And um, I didn't realize really how lucky we had been by doing our, the marketing we did in the beginning was all grassroots. It was like, you know, I don't like to say no to anybody ever. So every customer who asked for a gift card for their school auction or every, you know, of course I always said yes, but I didn't always say yes to exactly what they asked for. I, if, cause I couldn't do all of it, but you know, if I couldn't go to the event and cook there, I would offer to put something in the goodie bags or, you know, so basically it was a lot of community kind of um, marketing, just basic, you know, being there for my community of, of, patrons and you know never saying no to like the big name chefs like back in the day it was like Wolfgang would say can you come do the cancer benefit and we'd be like yeah of course and you know so um you'd never say no to somebody sort of who's up there a few steps ahead of you and asked you to do something and um and that's a good point too because you know you'd never know where the how things are going to come back around to either help you or hurt you. So every single interaction that you have with people in your community and your, you know, profession, your colleagues, you have to really, um, you know, just that old thing, treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Because I remember one time that one of our, one of the chefs that Susan and I worked for in the very beginning, back in the late seventies, he was a complete jerk to her, but he treated me fine. But you know, he treated her terribly and she'd be crying every day in the bathroom. And I couldn't figure out why he was so hard on her. Um, and then it turned out like 15 years later, we were hiring for a consulting job we were doing on the South, uh, South Street Seaport in New York City for a comedy club. And he applied for the job. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually hired him and we oh, got wow. to set his salary and everything. It turns out he was a very troubled guy at the time he uh was in a marriage with kids and Susan had just come out and she was you know had just divorced her husband and decided that she wanted to be with women and I think he was very like that was a struggle for him to see that by the time we re- we hired him he was he was out and happy gay man and um but you know it's interesting that um you know th- so many things and we were like 21 or 22 when we were working for him and then we were like 35 when we hired him back uh to this other restaurant so it was really a a, an interesting kind of thing that's crazy um i thought this was a great question and rarely do we put in the questions that are that are so positioned to someone's unique problem but it feels universal he said we have a large menu stuff with neighborhood favorites help me become unafraid to remove items said everyone <laughs> all the time yes so very well stated too um you know well i always say there are 
you you need a menu full of things that are irresistible, like craveable, like you can't get it out of your mind. Now, not every dish is going to be that good all the time. You know, we have our we have some certain ones that are really, really favorites. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and the pandemic has helped me with this too. A smaller menu is more executable at a higher level than a larger menu. Um, and so, you know, I'd rather see those craveable, the dishes that I think are craveable. And like, I'm going through this right now with the team and our chicken enchiladas, which are huge top sellers, but I don't really like them that well. I, I like them okay, but I think they need a little more like acid and tomatillo in them. And so, you know, we're kind of talking about how to change them or, you know, take them off the menu for a while. When they come back, they'll be my version. Um, but you, you just have to, you know, be unafraid to remove them, maybe just by in order to do that, you have to be more excited about the thing you want to replace them with or the things you want to sell. Because if you're super excited about those craveable, irresistible things that you think are just like absolutely home runs, then I think um, you just have to take the plunge and, and take those things off the menu. And you can always say, you know, look, it's a seasonal thing. We'll have them on again. Don't worry. And try this. And, and also, sometimes it's hard to get people to eat things that are on the menu. So Susan and I have, would always send out little tiny tastes to somebody, to people, just to, you know, anybody and say, Here, this, here's one of the, our new dishes. Here's just a couple bites of it. What do you think? Just to get them kind of um, excited about change. Yeah. Because people get really, they get used to their same old, same old oh, thing, yeah. but you can't, you can't keep growing your menu like that because your quality is definitely going to suffer and your food cost is going to suffer. And so, uh, but we, we change our menu quite a lot. And I think, um, I think that's good for, for everybody. It just makes it more interesting. Absolutely. We've got time for one more question before Q and I, I, I will end on this one, which is how did you become a celebrity chef? How would you recommend someone increase their public profile? Well, it, it was a, you know, a stumble into it by accident thing. It wasn't really um, an intentional thing. The first thing that happened was I got really upset. I was a new mom and I got really upset about um, ALAR on apples because, you know, kids eat apples. That's what they eat. And there was an article in the New York Times about this residue that was harmful and so I called the public radio station in LA and talked to the president. And I said, I want to have a radio, you know, like interstitial, like five minutes every, you know, day to talk about the things in your foods, in the food system that are not working for your body. And she said, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to scare people about their food, but why don't you come in and do like a one hour t radio show with you and Susan? you know, every Saturday morning. And so we started this radio show called Good Food, which still lives on. We did it for the first like five or six years. And then that, and that actually, the reason we were good at that was because we did a lot of cooking classes. And those cooking classes that we did together, sometimes for audiences as small as like seven people or 30 or whatever. But back in the eighties, we did a lot of cooking classes. So that's how we sort of got our, our, our chops down on how to um, how to really keep an audience entertained and excited while teaching or talking or whatever. And then um, then the radio show kind of helped us kind of get even better. And then um, then we were offered a TV show after uh, we wrote a couple cookbooks. And then the um, and we some people approached us about writing a cookbook. Um, so you know nowadays it's a different world. So there's TikTok. There's you know. Um, all the stuff that's going on on YouTube and on blogs and, and, you know, um, there's a lot of ways, but I think the the main thing about becoming a celebrity would be connecting with your audience, you know, how, and, and, you know, I'm not as big a celebrity as Carla Hall, you know, she's just better at connecting with her audience than I am, I think, or she was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, but, there are, um, you know, she's amazing, I think. 
She's absolutely oh, yeah. irresistible and compelling and, and so much fun. And it just like pops through the TV to, to you. And even when you're with her in person, she's amazing. So, um, but if you don't have that kind of personality, I don't know, maybe, maybe being a celebrity isn't your thing. I mean, I'm not as, I'm not as much that way as Susan is. She's, I think, a better celebrity than I am. But, um, you know, I love the attention I've gotten. I feel really very honored and, you know, thrilled. But it wasn't, an, it wasn't something I went after. I, I first wanted to cook the best food I could cook. And then I wanted to talk about food and the food system and how f- the food system is in peril and how it needs, you know, our attention. I, I think it's great advice. I think you really found a tribe. I think you and Susan did an amazing job of finding like-minded individuals that they were super passionate about what you were passionate about. And that that is what grew into the, the massive following that you have. Um, we, we do have time for a little Q&A. Um, awesome. Oh, ooh, we got a really good question uh, from Anonymous. It says, do you have an exit strategy? Great, great question. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I am constantly talking to my team about um, succession, you know, about each of them grooming somebody who's coming up alongside or behind them that they can really groom so that they can grow and do the next thing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have an exit plan. I, I think it's been a great, um, you know, year and a half during COVID to be able to really focus on other things and have the business still be okay. And, and through some of the hardest months we've ever, ever had to operate. And so that gives me a lot of, um, confidence in my team. I mean, I took a month off and went down the Colorado river in May and no internet no phone, just a raft and me and five other people. And my, my restaurants were fine. So I think my exit strategy is sort of try to take a month off every quarter and see what happens. And then, um, you know, uh, you know, years ago, we talked about building the company up to a certain point and selling it. And, you know, unfortunately, some of those decisions that we made around sustainability and around treating our team better and paying them better and buying their health insurance, those cut into the value of the business. It's just not as valuable because we're not making that kind of money that, you know, another restaurateur probably was making and could sell their company. So, um, but I've gotten so much joy out of my team and my company that I don't, you know, and, and we've made plenty of money too. Don't get me wrong. It's not like a charity. We're not doing all this for nothing, but (laughs) I do, I do think that um, the way I see it working for me and Susan is more kind of a a slow kind of transition into a lot less being a lot less involved and seeing where the team wants to take it. And then eventually, you know, somehow maybe passing it on to them. Right on. Chef, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, you're a superhero, a rock star, and like one of my favorite people on the planet. I uh, I, I mean it sincerely. I, I think you're, you're such an inspiration on, on so many levels. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us all um, and for answering everyone else's questions. Um, I look forward to chatting with you again soon. And thank you to everyone in the audience for attending. And thank you. It's such a pleasure, Josh. I adore you too. (laughs) Awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.